Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're based. Uh, my name is TJ Willits and I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I'm just looking at the people signing on and I'm going to give a, a few more moments to allow them to uh, navigate the system and get on so uh, we don't leave them behind when we start. So again, thank you for being on time. Thank you for your patience and the webinar will begin just in a few moments. Okay, we're going to begin today's webinar presentation. Again, my name is TJ Willits from Veolia Water Technology. I'll be your today's uh, your moderator for today. Uh, today's webinar presentation is entitled Enhanced Anaerobic Wastewater Treatment, uh, specifically at recycled paper mills. Just some technical things. You should obviously be hearing me speak now. Um, there are two options for audio. So if you're having issues with your audio, you could maybe switch over to the other option. Or you could either listen through your headphones or your computer speakers, or you could toggle that and uh, dial in with a phone call. There's a conference call number there. So you could try the other if you're having issues on one of them. Since there's so many people logged on today's webinar, we automatically muted everyone's uh, microphone. But no worries, uh, like we've mentioned before, this is an interactive webinar. And to allow you to interact with our panelists or with myself, you could go ahead, if you look on the right hand side, you could see that there is a, a box that says questions, a little chat box. Feel free to, throughout the presentation, to type in any questions that you may have. And what we have is a, a, some time after the main presentation to try to get through as many questions as possible with our expert panelists who are with us today. If you weren't aware, we are uh, at Veolia Water Technologies, we are holding a three-week live webinar uh, series here. And you can see some of the webinars we have scheduled there. We're uh, finishing up week one of our three-week uh, series. But if you head over to our website, veoliawatertech.com, you'll be able to go and browse uh, the live webinars that we have scheduled for the next couple of weeks, if they may be of interest to you. In addition to our live webinar series, uh, given the times, and there might be people more at home trying to increase their education in various topics related to water and wastewater, we went ahead and uh, unlocked our, our archives of webinars. So we have about 30 or more webinars available on demand. Again, this is at our website as well, veoliawatertech.com, and you could head over there and, and watch them at your leisure. Some additional uh, notes about today's webinar. We're going to give webinar participation certificates after today's webinar. Uh, and if you're on the line and have attended this webinar, you'll get a certificate, a PDF certificate emailed to you uh, using the GoToWebinar software within about a day or so. So be on the lookout for that. And something fun to, that we want to do is we really uh, value any feedback that we have. There is a survey that will be presented to everyone who's on the, uh, the call today. Um, if you take that call, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put everyone uh, in a survey, in a, in a raffle to win a $25 Amazon gift card. So take the survey, we're gonna pick and draw a name uh, within a day or, or two as well, and uh, we'll let the winner uh, know that he or she won. Uh, just one slide, you may or may not be familiar with Veolia Water Technologies. 
Uh, well, Veolia itself is the, the world leading environmental company. Uh, it's a global company. Our group, Veolia Water Technologies, focuses on three key pillars uh, as it relates to water and wastewater treatment. And those pillars are technologies, projects, and services. Uh, and we uh, have various personnel experience in, in every aspect of these three key pillars to make sure they uh, support our clients uh, in meeting their environmental and wastewater and water treatment goals. Uh, at this time, we're going to transition to our technical presentation. We're fortunate to have two experienced uh, expert panelists on the phone with us uh, on this webinar here today. Uh, our first panelist that you hear from is Rob Franken. He's the Senior Director of Business Development uh, here at Veolia Water Technologies. Uh, and Rob has more than 30 years of experience with biological wastewater treatment technologies. In his current role at Veolia, he works with various industrial clients to manage their wastewater treatment challenges. And he does this by applying uh, Veolia's extensive portfolio of biological solutions and technologies. This includes our Biothane UASB, our BioVet EGSB uh, for anaerobic treatment, as well as Memphane anaerobic MBRs. Uh, similar, in addition to anaerobic treatment, uh, he could employ Annex Colonist NBBR or Neosip NBR. Uh, and then prior to his role here in the States, he uh, also led as a managing director of Veolia's Biothane Technology Center for high rate anaerobic treatment and he was based in the Netherlands for that role. Also with us today is Timur Denive. He's the manager of process engineering at Veolia Water Technologies. Um, and he obtained a bachelor's of science and a master's of science in environmental engineering. Uh, and he's currently working on his PhD in the same field. Timur brings over 10 years of continued experience working on industrial and municipal wastewater treatment uh, with a special emphasis on biological processes. So at this time, I'm going to hand the webinar over, webinar over to Rob Franken. Rob, are you with us here today? I am TJ, thank you for that. So good day to everyone. Uh, happy to be here to present this to you. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, as uh, Veolia Water Technologies, we have been supporting uh, many different industrial clients and the pulp and paper industry is uh, among that client group. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have worked for basically all of the major global players uh, when it comes to pulp and paper uh, industries. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see the references that we have in the pulp and paper industry, generally speaking, as Fiolia. You can see there's many hundreds of them and that, uh, basically on every continent we have worked with uh, this uh, industry. Um, Veolia is a technology company, um, so we take the philosophy that we uh, own and operate our own technologies as part of our offering. Um, on this slide, you see a snapshot of some of the technologies that are that also relate to film paper industry. Uh, you can see high rate clarification with active flow. You see uh, evaporation technologies, uh, crystallizing technologies, uh, filter technologies with hydrotech disc filters or drum filters. There's aerobic technology with MBBR or activated sludge, as I'll show you later. We have a range of anaerobic technologies that we branded Biofane. Um, we have our own in-house dissolved air flotation units, uh, ion exchange systems, uh, smaller scale evaporator units, uh, biogas desulfurization technology. So we're trying to integrate all of our own technologies as part of the project that will provide the overall solution to our client. So on this webinar, we, we want to zoom in on our anaerobic um, capabilities when it comes to the treatment of paper mill effluent. So this is a little bit of an agenda. I will briefly discuss uh, the, the specific characteristics when it comes to this type of uh, wastewaters, what are the drivers for these projects, and then I'll hand over to Timur, who will explain to us what these anaerobic technologies are and what they can do for you. Uh, one specific element that we want to zoom in is on the calcium challenges, because that is something that is very apparent always in this type of effluent. And then I'll, I'll take over back again to explain some of the case studies uh, that we've done in several uh, countries. And then I'll wrap it up with uh, 
an overview of what we could do in turn and how we typically approach these type of wastewater projects. Um, so we're going to talk mainly about paper wastewater. Um, pulping industry is also, of course, a good candidate for anaerobic treatment. And on this slide, you can see that um, we've also treated wastewater from various type of pulping operations. Um, when it comes to those type of effluents, it's, uh, it's always very important to characterize those uh, carefully. Because uh, in, this, in this type of industry, more general for industrial wastewater, but certainly also for pulp and paper uh, applications, it is, uh, there are no, there's no such a thing as a one size fits all or three standardized systems that will do the job. We have to look at, we have to look carefully at every specific wastewater, uh, characterize it carefully and identify the critical components in the wastewater so that we can actually design and engineer the system uh, to get to a final performance that is required for the project. Uh, so here you see a list of, uh, of items that uh, are important. Obviously, it's uh, COD, BUD, suspended solids, uh, but also, for instance, not, not so much for paper applications, but for some pulping applications, toxicity is something to look at uh, if there's any inhibiting components. Um, for recycled paper industry, calcium is a very important uh, factor because it causes all sorts of, potentially causes all sorts of scaling in the system that can lead to, uh, to issues when you operate the plant. So that is something that you have to design for. Sulfate is important. It's always there and it will end up in, uh, in biogas as, uh, as hydrogen sulfide. So also that is important to understand and that we design our systems accordingly. And obviously we're talking about biological systems. So we must also make sure that the bacteria involved in all the processes are happy at all times. So they need to have their nutrients. We need to control uh, temperature, pH, uh, we need to give them steady load conditions. So those are all factors and parameters that we need to address when designing these systems. So the drivers for the project, so when should you be looking at this? Um, the most important driver is typically environmental compliance, um, either when there's a discharge to service water or discharge to a, a sewer. There will be a permit of some sort that will specify the, uh, the limits that need to be uh, met. And uh, those, uh, I mean, so therefore, treatment is obviously necessary in most cases. Uh, some other more specific drivers could be that, uh, especially when in, right now we're seeing a lot of activity in the, in the paper industry where mills are converting to uh, other products, mills are expanding because of an increased demand from our uh, from Amazon type clients. Uh, they all want to ship their, uh, their goods in, uh, in boxes. And uh, so there's a high demand for this type of product. And this has a, a direct effect on wastewater discharges. The last one that you see here is uh, the societal license to operate. Um, of course, all of our industries should behave uh, and uh, be good global citizens, they should be uh, cautious about uh, emissions from plants, um, odor uh, issues from plants, uh, carbon footprint considerations. So as Veolia, we are always very uh, conscious about this and we try to accommodate as much as we can our designs to, uh, to make that good for our clients. So at this point, uh, I think we're going to zoom in specifically on our anaerobic technologies to do all that. And uh, for that, I'm going to hand over to Timur, who will explain this in detail. Hey, Rob, thank you so much. Thank you, TJ. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is staying safe. And uh, let's jump in on some things that we can actually control uh, in this interesting environment that we have. When we're discussing the sustainable uh, treatment of industrial wastewater, the first two things that come in mind are aerobic and anaerobic biological treatments. Uh, I'm sure most of you know the differences, but in broad terms, uh, when we assess the type of technology that we're using, we're evaluating many things, and as with many things in engineering, uh, there is no clear-cut definitions, but in broad terms, aerobic technologies are use for slightly lower loads where you can have to get to lower standards of uh, discharge very very low concentrations and you will be consuming a lot of oxygen 
um, in order to do that. In anaerobic technologies, usually we think of them as pretreatment or high concentration wastewater treatments. And that's a biological technology that utilizes uh, environment and absence of oxygen to uh, convert organic carbon into methane and carbon dioxide. In broad terms, if you look at the mass balance of aerobic system and you have 100 kilograms of carbon going in, um, you will have carbon dioxide and heat loss at the amounts of approximately uh, um, 70 to 40 kilograms converted. And then two to 10 kilograms is going to go out. So you'll be enjoying very nice 90 to 98% removal efficiencies. But what's important to remember, you'll also be producing approximately 30 to 60 kilograms of COD, and we call this yield. Um, so very good discharge parameters. You can see 2 to 10, but decent amount of sludge and a decent amount of heat produced. When you would be looking in a similarly adjusted mass balance for anaerobic systems, you will see that 80% of your carbon is going to be um, is going to end in biogas. So where we produce carbon dioxide and heat in aerobic system, you will be producing CO2 and methane. Um, approximately 15 kilos of that is going to go out. So you still enjoy a very good removal efficiency of approximately 85%. Uh, in some systems, it's even better. Um, and only 5% of the influent load is going to end up in biomass, which, uh, which is very important, especially when you're talking about very large concentrations of COD going in and managing decent amount of solids that have to be disposed of and landfilled later on. Today we will be concentrating mostly on anaerobic technology and the reason is as I indicated in, in the beginning of aerobic versus anaerobic discussion is the load. Most of the pulp and paper effluents have decent concentrations of COD uh, in the range of 10 to 20,000 milligrams per liter. And anaerobic technologies fit really, really well to pretreat um, that amount of carbon and convert it to methane in an effective uh, and uh, environmental friendly manner in a small footprint. Um, as anaerobic specialists, we have quite a few technologies that fit our anaerobic profile. Some of them are listed here, such as upflow anaerobic slash blanket reactor biothane. Uh, Biobet EGSP, which is expanded, expanded granular bed system. Biobet Dual, which is a two, uh, it, which is a very effective system we use sometimes with two layers of separation. Memthane anaerobic membrane bioreactor, which is an excellent technology for different types of wastewater that have high FOGs, for example. And the conventional Biobulk Sparthane CSTR, which is a con continuous sister reactor um, system that has very good applications in some other industries as well. So let's discuss high rate technologies. The reason why we like high rate technologies for uh, pulp and paper industry is because with the high COD that you have, you also have very low suspended solids coming in. And that allows you to use um, granular technologies, the technologies that rely on granular biomass, which is an amazing example of biomimicry that we use in environmental engineering. So basically what you see here is high performance systems that rely on very high concentration of solids that we maintain using some hydraulic uh, mixing methods, um, hydraulic and biogas mixing methods, and uh, we broadly divide the high rate systems, which are very eff effective systems that require very little footprint because of the high concentration of biomass, are USB and EGSB. Technically, they're in the same family. They just have a little bit different applications depending on the influent wastewater, such as USB can handle a little bit more solids, and EGSB is a little bit taller and slimmer. So they all have very good applications uh, where to use them. But let's zoom in on them. So basically, when you look uh, either at USB or EGSB, you will be looking at a conditioning tank on the influent, which prepares the wastewater to be treated uh, in anaerobic conditions, such as providing proper concentration of nutrients and adjusting the pH. Then the influent wastewater is distributed over the, 
over the entirety of the reactor on the bottom through through our uh, distribution system and as wastewater travels up in the plug flow manner through the height of the anaerobic system it gets into contact with granular biomass which is called the sludge bed and the uh, organic fraction of the wastewater is being converted into methane and co2 and then on top we have our proprietary proprietary three-phase separators which uh, the three phases that we're discussing here are solids liquid and biogas uh, wherein we retain the granular biomass within the system, um, which is the solids, so they don't overflow and leave the system, so we maintain them inside. Um, a liquid is being clarified and separated and sent out as effluent, and biogas is then collected through the headspace of the system to either be flared or used for beneficial purposes, because uh, anywhere from 50 to 75% of biogas is methane, which, ha which is similar to your natural gas. Um, e what you see here is EGSB, which uh, uh, from the process flow diagram perspective is a similar technology, uh, except it's slimmer and taller and utilizes uh, much higher upflow velocities. Um, it has excellent influent distribution system, occupies very little space and relies on internal modular settler design for degassing and maintenance of biomass in the granular form within the vessels. Here you see some of the examples. So bottom left corner is a USB system. Then you have EGSB systems on, on the bottom and some examples of the modular settler systems being installed within the reactors. We, uh, we manufacture our reactors from variety of, of materials, whatever is necessary for the industry. Uh, or whatever is necessary for the site conditions, but we we have done systems in FRP, uh, epoxy coated bolted steel tanks, stainless steel welded tanks, um, and even concrete tanks where applicable. So to summarize, the main advantages that we have is still we enjoy very high CO2 removal efficiencies, which will improve, which can be used as a pretreatment and the direct and the discharge to your sewage authority. Or if you need further treatment, it could be a very good pretreatment then to decrease the load to the, to the treatment that's going to be coming after the anaerobic system. Very short retention time compared to all the other technologies. And we enjoy the short retention time because we have the capability of retaining the biomass. And you see on the photo, very nice representation of how biomass stays within the system. So we don't lose it and we use it for the conversion of organic matter. Um, various materials of the tanks and tank sizes very low energy uh, needs all we need is the influent pump and the basically uh, all you need for the entirety of the system there's no internal mixers nothing like that um and only two to four percent of crd gets converted to sludge which for high loaded system can amount to a big difference in the amount of solids that you need to handle and on-site biogas production produces you 0.4 to 0.5 cubic meters of biogas uh, per kilogram of COD converted, which can offset your energy use within the facility. As I mentioned, uh, we, we, what we do is we rely on biomimicry from Mother Nature here. Um, uh, some time ago, approximately 30 to 40 years, no, no, 40 to 50 years ago now, sorry, um, scientists observed that um, under certain conditions, Synergistic microorganisms in the syntropic relationship, and you don't think about those terms and in, in basically think about the conglomeration of microorganisms that agree to live with each other, under certain conditions can granulate. So what they do, they form this very nice caviar looking biomass. Um, and the good advantage of this biomass is that it's very dense and has very, very high settling velocity. So if we go to the next slide, I think we'll be able to see the demonstration and I can continue talking through. So what you see here is a video of granular biomass being put in a, in a, in a clean water, in a jar. They're being stirred together. And what you observe is that within seconds, you will start seeing clarification of biomass and agglomeration of the biomass on the bottom of the flask yeah, the videos keep on going. But I think you're getting the feel of what's going on. So we, 
By adjusting the internal conditions, which is the engineered part of the system, we allow for this very specific type of microorganisms to conglomerate in a granular form that allows us to maintain a very large inventory within the system and enjoy very high removal efficiencies and very small footprint in our high-rate system. But we would definitely be amiss if we do not discuss calcium for the recycled paper mirror effluents. So calcium um, occur, calcium leaches from the, from the recycled paper. So even if you apply all the measures you can at the paper mill, you will still have a decent concentration of calcium in the system. And also a lot of mills use lime for the stabilization and as bactericide within the systems, which further could further increase the concentration of calcium overall in the wastewater. So if you ask what could be the issue, the issue is that calcium uh, could form calcium carbonate precipitation. So here what you're looking at is um, a flow diagram of logic and what I call a vicious circle of having high concentration of calcium in your system. So let's start at the top. In a system that would have high concentration of calcium, let's say over 400 to 500 milligrams per liter on the insulin. As I mentioned in anaerobic systems, when we convert organic carbon in anaerobic conditions, we produce methane and CO2. Part of the methane and CO2 do stay dissolved in water, especially CO2, because the solubility of CO2 is much higher than methane. And if you, uh, if you have high enough concentration of calcium and CO2, which will become bicarbonate uh, based on the pH equilibrium in the system, you will start for, forming calcium carbonate. So small amounts of calcium carbonate are not an issue. But if you start forming enough calcium carbonate, and you will see the, the arrow going to the right, you will start producing very heavy solids. And heavy solids will start doing three things at the same time. So let's travel north first. Once you start producing your crystals, and I'm sure many of you have seen those cool videos of sugar being mixed in the water, and then you drop one small crystal, and all of a sudden you precipitate everything out of it. And we call that uh, the saturation concentration. Once you start producing calcium carbonate in the system, it can start acting as a crystal formation nucleus or a seeding crystal, which can further increase the calcium carbonate precipitation. From the heavy sludge block, let's now travel south. So when you start, um, forming heavy sludge, you will also start creating poor mixing zones. In the industry, we have a very nice term, it's called rat holing. So once you have heavy enough sludge, you will start seeing various rat holing effects. So what happens is some water starts bypassing, biogas starts forming in an uneven fashion, but ultimately you will also see a local high pH in the sludge bed. And once you increase the pH, you will also start increasing the calcium carbonate precipitation. And reactor will start overloading for non-stagnant zones. But also ultimately, once you start forming heavy solids, you keep them in a system. And you start, even if you want to start getting rid of it before, because of rat holing and sloping, all of you know how it, if you start pulling something uh, uh, heavy from the water, you at some point will not be able to pull it out. Um, and that leads to a selective withdrawal of light organic sludge from the system and ultimately will accumulate a lot of solids. In. So on the next slide, let's examine chemistry a little bit further. Basically what you see here is, um, on the right, let me quickly go over it. As I said, once CO2 is soluble in the, way, in the, in, in, in the water, Based on the pH, it will form various, it will stay in a various form. And that's the bicarbonate balance in the water. A lot of you know about it from your alkalinity measurements. And where we operate the reactors, which is between 6.8 and 7.2, you will see that most all of the CO2 is in the bicarbonate form, which will facilitate the calcium carbonate precipitation. And now let's look at the two graphs on the left. 
they're basically identical. It's just in one we looking at the total calcium, and the other one we're looking at the solar level calcium. But basically, what you see on the y-axis is your inlet calcium concentration, and on your x-axis, I'm sorry, and on your y-axis is what we call your calcium accumulation, which effectively basically means influent calcium minus effluent calcium. So if you lose calcium in the system, it means that the calcium stays within the reactor. So what we want, where we want to be ideally, ideally we want to be around zero of calcium accumulation. So your influent calcium is equal to your effluent calcium. And as you can see from those graphs, that concentration is somewhere around 450 milligrams per liter. So we really like to stay to the left of that concentration. As soon as you start going up, anywhere above 400 milligrams per liter, you immediately start seeing precipitation, which you start showing as the difference between inlet and effluent calcium. And at some point, the difference could be quite stark. So for example, take a look at 800 milligram per liter influent calcium, and you will see that you will precipitate approximately 150 milligram per liter of calcium in the system, which over the time can accumulate very, very fast. So what will happen if you accumulate so much calcium? Here is a, a very good example of what could happen. Calcium carbonate is very heavy, very, very hard to get rid of, and you will get a horror picture of what you see here. Actually, this, these photos are not as horrific as they could be, and the only reason is because these are the photos from a sugar beet industry where they also use a lot of lime for, for wastewater stabilization. But the advantage that they have is that they actually are okay with the controlled precipitation because they only run approximately six to seven months a year. And for the rest of the year, they don't run. And basically once a year, what they do, they come in, they remove the panel, and then they basically shovel out the calcium carbonate from the system. Obviously, in recycled paper mills, we do not want that because we run 24-7, 365. We want to enjoy the continuous operation, and that's why watching for calcium and knowing how to handle calcium is very, very important, which, which, which is what we specialize. At this point, uh, Rob, the floor is back yours to discuss how we manage th things like this and tell us the good stories. Thank you, Timur. <clears throat> So let me dive into a, a number of case studies. So before I do that, here you can see, um, I showed you the slide earlier where we showed the uh, number of uh, filter paper clients that we serve uh, globally. This slide shows the anaerobic treatment plants where our technology is used on a global basis. So we have something like six, 650 references worldwide. And of these, there are about 70 of them are in the recycled paper industry. And I'm going to highlight a few of those. So um, typically these, uh, right now these, uh, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's quite a big demand for this type of uh, solution because uh, many of the, uh, the clients in this uh, industry are converting their mills and they're expanding their capacity. So that is uh, also a driver for this project that we've done. Um, <clears throat> this one, is a project in Europe. If you go to the next slide, yeah. So this was actually an expansion project. So in, if you look at the left top corner picture, the uh, the black reactor that was a, a biobed system that had been running there for uh, quite a few years, and the plant was expanded with uh, additional two biobed reactors. As a matter of fact, uh, we didn't mention that yet, uh, yet but um, as Fiolia, we're also operator of treatment plants, and this is an example of a, a system that is also operated by Fiolia. Um, the capacity of this system is uh, some after the expansion and the upgrade is about 46 ton of CD per day. It's a typical CD load that we, that we can see uh, coming from uh, recycled paper mills. And in this system, we also provided uh, a, what we call the sulfotane uh, biogas desulfurization unit, which takes the H2S out of the biogas with a, a biological technology. Uh, another case, uh, 
is a, a project where we have done in, um, in Australia. Um, this is a system where we also apply a calcium removal um, step in order to dilute incoming effluent. I'll, I'll show that to you on the next slide. What we do here is we uh, apply uh, the bio EGSB system. You see those two tower type systems in the, on the picture. And in this case, the calcium is uh, in the influent is higher than we can normally tolerate uh, on, a, on an anaerobic process like this. So what we do here, we apply our, we call it sometimes our calphane system. What we do is we take the anaerobic effluent and we uh, go through a kind of a higher rate aerobic treatment step. And what happens if you take anaerobic effluent and you start aerate that, then obviously you're pushing out CO2 and you're driving the equilibrium towards the precipitation of uh, more calcium carbonate uh, because the pH also goes up if you uh, push out the CO2. So what happens is that calcium carbonate will uh, precipitate out, will will combine with the, the sludge that is formed in this system. And after clarification, you have a, a wastewater or an effluent, I should say, which is relatively low in calcium. And in this case, we use that water to recycle back to the inlet of the plant in order to get below this threshold calcium levels that uh, Timur just explained. So this is one way, uh, one approach that we can take if calcium levels are higher than we would like to see them and we can apply this type of internal circulation over an aerobic and high rate aerobic system. So this, uh, this is a system that was uh, done a few years ago in Germany, in, in Europe. So Timur also mentioned 80%, 85%, uh, sometimes we see 90% removal in the anaerobic system. It depends a little bit on, on the type of effluent and uh, the combination of uh, factors there. Uh, this is a, a quite recent project we've done in Australia. This is also a welded steel uh, biobed system for a, a large packaging company in the United States. Key driver for the project was to uh, get into regulatory compliance. <clears throat> and the next slide shows some of the results in this, in this plant. Um, on the graph here on the left, you can see the, uh, the COD total COD, soluble COD, and BOD removals. Now, as, I, as we said before, I mean, COD removals typically are in the 85 to 90% range. Um, here you can see BOD removals are always higher than 90%. So you can see that this is a very effective solution to cut down uh, very significantly in a high rate, low footprint, uh, cost-effective process to remove the bulk of COD, BOD. Um, we didn't mention that, but obviously uh, in anaerobic treatment, you don't remove nutrients for recycled paper industry. That is not really important because nitrogen and phosphorus are typically deficient. We actually have to add those in the treatment line to, uh, to provide as a nutrient to the biology. Uh, this system, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, also has a calphane process. So also here, we precipitate out the calcium from the anaerobic effluent in order to generate a, an effluent which is low in calcium that we can use to dilute the incoming wastewater. Uh, this is also a project, almost 50 tons COD per day, and uh, has been running for a few years now. Uh, this is the last project I wanted to show you. Um, this is a project, uh, this is actually uh, very recent. Uh, this is a project we're doing in the south of the United States where we are building a, a complete new anaerobic plus aerobic treatment system for a, a large recycled paper mill. Um, again, it's a, it's a, they're all the same, 45 ton, 50 ton CD per day is a typical range, 1 million gallon. Um, we're, we will produce something like 500 SCFM of biogas. Um, the biogas will be used in the, in the plant boilers uh, and we will treat it with our sulfotane technology to a limit of 25 ppm. That is in a two-stage treatment because with a biological desulfurization process, you typically don't reach that in one step. So we also have a post-treatment step on the biogas. Uh, coming from 15,000, obviously you can imagine that uh, a two-step approach is uh, appropriate. 
so this system will have, and I'll, I'll show that uh, on the on the next slide. This system will have uh, both anaerobic as well as um, aerobic treatment. Here you can see uh, a glance in a glance an overview of the total system. Equalization tanks always important. Uh, many recycle mills have always have cooling. Uh, wastewater tends to be on the hot, uh, on the warm side. So we have uh, heat exchangers there to cool. And then we go into the actual anaerobic process with the conditioning tank and the biobed EGSB that Timur just explained. And then the anaerobic effluent will go into a more or less conventional activated sludge process with sludge return. And the, uh, the final effluent from the clarifier then will be uh, suitable and meet all the permit conditions. And some of that can also be reused. The sludge in this case will be uh, uh, recycled back to the mill. And as I mentioned before, we're going to uh, clean the gas with the, with the sulfatane process and an after treatment. And then there's compressor dryer to pump the gas back to the mill boiler. Uh, Biogas flare is always part of a project. So in case the gas cannot be used for whatever reason, then it will be uh, burned uh, and uh, in a controlled condition. So that's a, a nice uh, overview of uh, a quite kind of a full project to get from 15, 20,000 CODs all the way back to like less than 300. So those were the case studies that I wanted to share with you. Um, so how would we typically approach a treatment project when something like this comes up? So what are the considerations? Um, I mentioned uh, briefly on this before. So when you're paying surcharges, uh, high sewer fees, uh, we can really cost effectively cut down on BOD, CD charges because this is a very compact low operating cost system to cut out any of the, the, the BOD and COD. Um, if you are struggling to maintain compliance on BOD, COD, TSS, then obviously you need to look at this type of treatment. Um, your, your permits could be changing, environmental regula legislation could be changing. Uh, we see uh, quite uh, stronger demands on nitrogen and phosphor limits that are being imposed on the industries. All these could be um, factors that could drive uh, a project. Uh, obviously, and we've discussed it before, plans are expanding. Uh, wastewater is changing <clears throat> due to changing production capacities. Um, and then there's always the consideration, okay, how much space do I have? Uh, sometimes some of our clients have plenty of space, so then it's not a consideration. But sometimes we have to try to fit in a new plant into a very tight infrastructure. And then also that is a, a driver for a high rate anaerobic technology. Um, yeah, so those are all factors that come into play when you want to consider new project. How we would typically go about this is, first of all, you need to understand uh, the drivers for the project. What are you trying to accomplish with the treatment plan? And all of that should be based on a, a clear definition of uh, what is the wastewater, what are the characteristics. As I started out saying in my introduction, we need, really need to understand very well what the uh, design basis of the system is. And we regularly go out to, uh, to a site to do uh, an audit, also to see how, can, how an existing infrastructure or an existing treatment plant can be integrated into an upgraded facility. Um, so this is the type of activity that we do as a service, uh, and uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, but we also have a very uh, well-utilized uh, laboratory in, in New Jersey that will provide uh, all this type of research and uh, study work that we can do on specific effluents to not only to validate certain designs, but also to uh, provide uh, justification for performance warranties that we provide with our systems. So, okay, so when you get in touch with us, if you have uh, any uh, of these uh, considerations that I mentioned earlier, and there are the drivers for the project, then um, we would like to really get in touch with you to discuss this and try to get a, to get a grip on that situation and to see how we can help you to sort out those issues. I think that is a kind of a wrap up that I wanted to do. I think this is the last slide. Yeah, yeah so, thanks. Thanks Rob for, uh, and, and Timur for that. Um, we have some time left to go through some questions. I just want to remind everyone that 
We have a chat box that you can enter in the questions uh, on the right hand side of the screen. We received a handful of questions already, uh, but if you want to send a question, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible during the time that we have left here. Um, so I'm just going to try to get through some of these questions if that's all right. Um, we have a question about what do we define as high strength COD load? What, how many pounds or tons per day is what we sort of consider high strength? I'll take that one so uh, and Rob can fill in. Uh, we start evaluating anaerobic system at approximately 4,000 milligrams per liter. Usually we find that anything below that is probably not going to work, though we have exceptions. Uh, but definitely anything above five to 6,000 milligrams per liter, depending on the solid load, is an immediate candidate for anaerobic system. And there is no ceiling to that. So we, we have influence systems with hundreds, with hundreds of thousands of milligrams per liter of uh, COD. And sort of um, just following up a little bit, how does the TSS levels uh, affect an anaerobic system? What kind of ranges can, can uh, anaerobic systems treat? Anaerobic systems can treat a, a massive range of, of influence solids. What we look at is what the solids are, and then we also look at what kind of technology would be uh, applicable. So if you have a couple hundred milligrams per liter, we can confidently use a high rate system. So basically, a rule of thumb is if your solids are less than, if your solid concentration is less than 10% of your influence COD, we can probably use high rate system. If you have more solids than that, we will just simply be moving away from utilizing high rate systems. So, um, especially if your solids are biodegradable. Let's say you're talking about food and bath industry with high FOG, I don't know, dairy, for example, and you have 10,000 10, milligram per liter of suspended solids, but they're mostly fats, oils, and grease, highly biodegradable. We will just move into our um, sparthane or Biobolic CSTR system and 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 if and I can chime in there, Timur. I mean, I think in specifically for recycled paper industry, I think more, more often than not, we see that uh, in the mills there will be uh, fiber recovery units like dissolved air flotation or other technology there. So typically, we get uh, when it reaches us at the treatment plant, typically suspended solids are less than 300, 400, 200 ppm range, which is ideal for high rate granular sludge treatment. That, so yeah. that's what I meant that specifically for recycled paper mills. And uh, Rod, if you could follow up a little bit, that talks about the range of handling TSS in the system, but what about in the affluent after anaerobic? How do you account and treat, uh, do, to do tertiary treatment of, uh, of TSS afterwards? So the, our, our rule of thumb, because this, this is a, these are high rate granular sludge bed systems they typically do not convert TSS. <clears throat> so our rule of thumb is that whatever goes in comes out. And sometimes even a little bit more because we have some suspended growth of bacteria that also wash out with the uh, system. So typically, uh, but on the other hand, sometimes there's also a biodegradable part of the TSS. So you see some conversion of that solace. So overall, that's why I say our rule of thumb is what goes in comes out. Um, and there are plenty of exceptions to that. So as I said, also, there are no one size fits all solutions. So typically it depends also a little bit on the application, but that's the general rule of thumb. Okay, um, if we could switch gears to talk about biogas, is how much H2S concentration is expected in biogas? Is there a range? Uh, and then I'll read the second part of this question. If there is no sulfur components in the feed water, the sulfur components come from nutrient dosing only. Is that correct? So, um, you want to? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so it, whatever goes in and as sulfate or sulfur in the influent, a, um, a par portion of that will be converted to hydrogen sulfide. As a matter of fact, if you have like sulfate in the influent, I mean, ninety percent of that will be reduced by sulfur-reducing bacteria to a hydrogen sulfide. So for recycled paper mills specifically, we're talking 
somewhere between a half to one and a half percent of H2S that we see typically. That is 5,000 to 15,000 ppm of H2S in the gas. Um, so, I mean, if there is no sulfate or sulfur source in the influent, then typically we also see no H2S and the contribution of sulfur that we actually dose with the nutrients, that is negligible. I don't think you would, you would hardly see that coming out of the gas. Okay, we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'm going to just keep going here. Um, how have you managed calcium in mills that recycle the treated effluent back to the mill? Um, you can try to limit uh, production of calcium in the mill, but not much can be done about the inlet conditions. How do you remove it while it's in that recycle loop? So that's an excellent question. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll open a little bit more broadly and summarize what we already said during the presentation. There is two ways to, to manage calcium. One is prevention, and that's basically if the mill prevents using lime and use uh, bacteria sites instead in, in, in the upstream. And also we can re remove and, and manage calcium on the effluent from anaerobic systems. So Rob briefly mentioned calcane system, which is basically aerobic flash aeration, short HRT system with a clarifier, which where we take the calcium and we precipitate it in a controlled fashion in a system where we do want to precipitate it. And then we take the effluent and we can dilute the influent to the anaerobic system to that approximately 400 milligram per liter range. If we can keep it there in 400 milligrams per liter, then we do not worry about precipitation. Okay, um, another question here. Uh, what do you, or do we find the need to add micronutrients at uh, wastewater treatment facilities for pulp and paper? Yes, yes. So usually we see very low phosphorus, decent amount of nitrogen, and we do need to add all of the micros. Okay. Um, I think you talked a little bit about calcane process in, in more detail. Um, the question would be is, how do you, for example, how do you prevent um, calcium carbonate from plugging the air injectors in the aeration? There are various ways to approach that. Um, so first of all, once again, depending on the influent concentration of calcium, then proper selection of diffusers in these systems, we would not use anything besides coarse bubble diffusers with high calcium. And then you will have a chemical injection port on the diffuser so you can backwash them with acid in order to remove the scaling if you choose to go that route. And then there are other systems, they're called um, mixer aerators, uh, submersible or not. Uh, I mean, we, we've used salt or alkyl systems. We've also used invent mixers which uh, utilize uh, external motors and small aeration systems to mix and aerate systems like this. Okay, um, it's sort of an operational question. Uh, as you mentioned, Veolia operated some of the facilities that, that we, we engineer. How does that impact process guarantees when uh, the operational arm of Veolia is involved? Okay, so, uh... That is a very uh, general question, and I think there is no general answer to that. Um, so obviously, uh, when we build systems, we provide performance warranties, uh, but they end after an acceptance test has been done, as a, as a general statement. And then it depends on the type of contract that we get for the operation and maintenance. So I, I could not um, I could not give a, a more specific answer than that. Um, it's also as uh, within Veolia, it's a different division that will do it. We will we work one on one with each other to organize uh, that type of approach, but it is uh, certainly something that uh, is uh, always up for discussion. And uh, but no general answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, some other questions here is what would be a typical post aerobic to pre anaerobic recirculation ratio? used to decrease the calcium concentration in a recycled, recycled container board mill? 
Uh, the, the recycle ratio is a direct proportional to the influent concentration of calcium. So once again, the magic number is around 400. If you have 600, then we will need to return 50% uh, of the effluent to dilute it down 50%, and so on and so forth. So it's just a permutation on what, what you use. Uh, obviously, aerobic system is not going to precipitate calcium perfectly either. We expect approximately 50 to 75% of calcium precipitation at uh, aerobic pHs. So, so we will calculate the ratios based on that. Okay. Now, it looks like a good question about one of the case studies, Rob, that said the BOD seemed a little bit high on uh, 220 ppm. Uh, was this particular case study a pretreatment uh, facility? Do you know offhand? Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is for uh, discharge to a sewer, so this is not sur uh, surface water discharge. So the, uh, the aerobic treatment that is in that particular case is there to indeed provide recirculation water with low calcium, and uh, the BUD is after say a high rate aerobic system. Of course, we all know that you can get BUDs as low as 10 or 5 if you have more extended uh, activated sludge or extended aeration. But that was not done in that particular project, in that particular case study that I presented. Okay, a um, couple biogas questions. Um, do we install H2S scrubbers for the vent stream? Is that something you're able to comment comment on, Timur? For the so, can you repeat the question because I'm not sure if it's about biogas or odor. Do you install H2S scrubbers for the vent stream? Is what the the asker? Yes, it's my odor treatment. Yeah, I, well, first of all, broadly, yes to both. We do biogas desulfurization and we do odor control systems. So for biogas desulfurization, our systems include biological biogas desulfurization using alkaline environment, uh, which is our sulfethane system. We use chemical scrubbers. We use adsorption media systems depending on the load and the treatment, as uh, Rob mentioned. And we also use similar fleet of technologies for the odor control. We install biotricking filters, bioscrubbers, chemical scrubbers, and adsorption systems for the odor control. Okay, um, I'm just going to keep going here. Um, uh, what is the maximum mass flow rate of biogas produced within this process? Uh, there is directly proportional to the influent uh, load. So, for example, uh, I don't know, one million gallon at fifteen thousand milligrams per liter is five hundred cfm of biogas. I don't know if it helps or not. Uh, okay, question I, uh, about the so go ahead, no, no, go ahead, TJ. Uh, the question about the uh, sludge bed is how do you ensure that there's a sufficient amount of granular sludge in the system? That's an excellent question. So, first of all, when we start up by anaerobic systems, we do provide seed solids so as part of the execution of the system we do like to provide a few um, approximately 10 feet of of, of bed preceded from existing from other existing facilities and then once we start up the system uh, and we establish the proper recirculation rates upflow velocities biogas productions and we grow enough solids what we have is we have solid sampling ports on the side of our high rate systems. And what you do, you basically, excuse me, you basically collect solids from various heights within the system, which provides you with the information on the biomass inventory that you have in the system. And then once you know your inventory, we know the amount of solids we want to keep in the system. So we keep on growing if we have too little or we add it externally. And if we start growing too much, we start to withdraw the biomass from the bottom. And some clients prefer storing them on site in the, in the slide storage systems in cases of upset to restart the system faster. And there is also a huge market in the United States and North America for the, for the secondary market for the anaerobic biomass. Basically, people who have high-rate anaerobic systems sell it to other people who have upset conditions or something else and we can always help with that if you need help uh and we have sort of two questions but i think they could be answered similar so i'm going to read them both and then if um if rob if you could take this one 
Uh, it says, what is the accepted fluctuation in COD load to high rate anaerobic reactors per day per hour? That's one question. Uh, a related question would be is, what level of pre-acidification pre do you use in terms of hours of retention time? So I think you can maybe touch on, on both of those sort of in the, the, the okay. summed up answer. So, I mean, it's a, it's a good question because anaerobic treatment likes to see as constant conditions as possible. Now, we all know that it, it, uh, to have perfectly constant conditions is impossible. So, um, as I showed also in a number of these, show, uh, of these case studies, we have equalization tanks up front. Uh, typically, we need a minimum of eight hours residence time, uh, but we do up, up to 24 hours, depending on the characteristics and uh, the, the patterns of flow discharge. So equalization, somewhere between eight and 24 hours. Uh, and of course, I mean, you always want to be as cost effective as possible. So we tend to go smaller, but if necessary, then we go bigger. Um, we control uh, pre-acidification in a way by uh, having controlled conditions starting in the EQ tank. So we can control pH. Uh, we can actually add the nutrients if there is a, such a deficiency that pre-acidification is limited and we can control those conditions already in the EQ tank. So we typically like to have something like 40% of the COD uh, present as uh, volatile fatty acids, um, but it's not a very strict parameter. So anywhere between 30 and 50% will be, uh, will be okay. And that is typically what we see if we have the, the proper conditions in the uh, equalization tanks. Okay, um, well, at respect of everyone's time, uh, we're gonna conclude today's webinar. I first want to thank the two expert presenters, Rob and Timur, for sharing their expertise with us and everyone here on the line. I'd like to also thank anyone who spent an hour with us here at Veolia to learn a little bit more about uh, how to enhance uh, anaerobic treatment at recycled paper mills. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, you can feel free to get in touch with myself, TJ Willits, or Rob Franken. Would love to talk uh, more about any project that you might have or any questions you might have. Just a reminder, upon exit, please remember to take the survey and you'll be entered in for a chance to win an Amazon gift card. And lastly, uh, if you visit our website at veoliawatertech.com, this webinar will be put up within 24 hours on our website to watch on demand, along with uh, several other webinars uh, you can watch at your leisure. So again, I wish everyone a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and ask that uh, everyone stay safe and uh, hope to see you soon. Take care.